These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net. Sargon the Great, King of Akkad, King of Sumer. Everyone in the world acknowledged his superiority, and above the world, the gods themselves showered him with favor. In one poem about his reign, he recounts 34 victorious battles, his many conquered territories, his tremendous wealth, and his massive standing army, and calls out to the men of the future, saying, You who would be my equal, go and conquer all the places I have conquered. A line that likely inspired Percy Bryce Shelley's similar, Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. As mentioned in the last episode, chronology for Sargon's reign is just a mess. But my own interpretation is that his last years were fairly quiet. There is a much later story from Babylonian times that says the various cities of Sumer, deciding that he was getting old and perhaps a bit feeble, thought they could join together and rebel in one huge mass. But as Sargon is reported to have said, he may be old, but his teeth and claws were still sharp, and he managed to crush the united rebel army in a single massive battle. My own opinion on this is that the storytellers were confusing the rebellion that happened during Sargon's son reign and mistakenly putting it in his own era. My own impression is that Sargon generated such awe and terror in the entire region that none dared to oppose him. After all, it's not for nothing that he was the singular greatest figure of the Bronze Age, the man against which all other men were measured until the coming of Alexander the Great 2,000 years later. In any case, Sargon spent his last years relatively calmly, ordering constructions, managing, though perhaps not participating in, small border skirmishes against the nomads at the Empire's fringes and enjoying his wealth. He died of natural causes at an extremely old age for his era. His reign is usually given as being around 55 years long, so he would have been well into his 70s or maybe even his 80s when he finally passed on, leaving control of the world's first empire to his son, Ramush. Now, according to legend, Ramush and his brother Manish Tushu were twins, and Manishtashu was actually born first, a few minutes before his brother. However, the Akkadians believe that with twins, the one born first was actually second to be conceived, reasoning that the elder child would have been squished against the back of the womb when the father created a second child in the same womb. Uh, since the Akkadians believe that the woman had no part in reproduction except to be the so-called soil in which the seed grows. It was considered a credit to Sargon's masculinity that his seed was so potent as to be able to reap two harvests from the same field, as it were. Thus, Ramush, second-born, would be considered the first conceived and hence the elder inheriting son. Part of the speculation about this is that the fact that their name, if put in birth order, is actually a pun, if not a very good one. In Akkadian, it would be, Man ish to shoe, Ramush, a phrase meaning approximately, who is with him? His beloved, indicating that their father desired for the two of them to work closely together and get along well. Despite the corny naming, this was it not to be. Twins or not, the brothers would have been born somewhere in the middle of Sargon's reign and spent quite a long time as princes, Ramush taking the throne somewhere in his 30s or early 40s. As can be imagined, the Akkadian Empire was not exactly popular with the many, many peoples they had spent the last 50 years conquering, and with the invincible conqueror finally felled by the passage of time, revolts sprang up across the empire with city-states demanding a return to independence, led particularly by a once unthinkable alliance of Ummah and Lagash. Ramush had spent his entire life preparing to be king and appears to already be well familiar with his father's army. 
the Akkadian force descends upon Sumer for the first time in 50 years, and the course of the battle is nearly the same as it had been the previous time. The Akkadians absolutely crush the Sumerian army in a massive battle, followed up by a blitz of the rebellious cities. But for the Sumerians and Akkadians, conquering a foreign city and subjugating a rebellious one are two very different matters, and the aftermath of this war has some startling numbers. 23,000 dead rebels and another 50,000 captives, numbers that historians seem to take as fairly credible. I find it hard to believe that any army in this era can field a force of 70,000, but I suppose if we take this as a genuinely mass rebellion, emptying many of the cities of their fighting age men, then it is certainly possible. Rumush then took those 50,000 rebels, tied them all up, and murdered all 50,000 of them in cold blood. He then marched his army from city to city, presided over rounding up civilians in large numbers, particularly but not exclusively the fighting age men, held public executions to demonstrate his seriousness, then took a large chunk of each city and sent them to history's first concentration camps, slave labor facilities in the Iranian mountains where they mined stone until they fell over dead. A few cities outside Sumer also joined in the rebellion, but within the year they had faced the same fate. Ramush was not kidding around. The demographic consequences of this are hard to understate. We know particularly that the entire Gu'eden, the 134,000 hectares of land over which Uma and Lagash had fought so bitterly, were confiscated and settled entirely by Akkadians to the great humiliation of both former rivals. But this is just one of many similar instances. Akkadians, both noble and peasant, were brought down to occupy the lands of the dead and enslaved, filling Sumer with a population that spoke Akkadian. Under Sargon's reign, Akkadian had been the language of government, and the Sumerian nobility would have been largely bilingual by the time of his death, but this massive population shift, in which a tremendous proportion of the male Sumerian population was killed off and the void filled by foreign Akkadians, brings the Akkadian language into general usage to a much greater extent than previously. The two languages and cultures would continue to coexist both formally and informally and intermingle pretty frequently, but this is the beginning of a long shift in dominance that in a few hundred years will see Sumerian becoming a dead language used only for ancient religious ritual, much like modern Latin in the Catholic Church. The empire was already Akkadianizing, but this has massively sped things up for the cultural heartland of the region. Ramush has a few more scattered fires to put out, but with the end of the revolt, he spends some time undertaking the religious rituals required to deify his father. This was partly a move to help secure the empire against further revolt, since Sargon had been loved or feared by all his subjects, and having him join the ranks of gods would remind everyone that he is still watching. There's also undoubtedly a bit of personal glorification going on here, since if his father is a god, then that makes Ramush the son of a god, and therefore a cut above the common man. This is a curious reimagining of the relationship between gods and men for the Sumerian mind. Recall that previously it was believed that the gods created men out of clay for the sole purpose of having slaves to do all their work for them. There were some who looked to the example of Gilgamesh to say that there were some men who were occasionally deified, though long after their death. But when I look at Gilgamesh in particular, I see him as more of a particularly honored dead human, being given a nice job in the afterlife, not something on a level with the other gods. Which means that the ascension of Sargon to godhood involves a fundamental reconception of divinity within the Sumerian religion.
Now, since it continued to be Akkadian practice to put close relatives in high priest positions, this theological question was smoothed over in the public consciousness. But it begins a religious change that will continue and continue to be contentious for a few more centuries at least. But while Ramush was doing all this, something was stirring in the East. The vassals in Elam had also decided that Sargon's death would be the right time to break away from the Akkadians, and a rising power to the east of them, King Abul Gamash of Marhashi, looked like a tempting ally. As obscure as the Elamites were, the Marhashi are even more deeply obscured by history. Where the Elamites occupied the southwest of modern Iran, Marhashi was somewhere east or maybe southeast, and was a stopover along the overland trade route from the Indus Valley civilization to Mesopotamia. They had at least some amount of small cities, were civilized to some degree, and likely adopted writing from their western neighbors, eventually transmitting it further east along the trade route to India. Seriously, even most of that description is inference, though if it's any consolation, Rimush and the Akkadians might not have known too much more about them either. The Elamites seem to have hoped that Rimush would simply be too busy to notice the change in allegiance, but by the third year of his reign, the fires were out, and he could assemble his army to march eastward toward the disloyal vassals. It was a hard campaign, but the army had retained the institutional knowledge from his father's campaign into the region, and indeed, Ramush himself may have participated in that previous expedition as crown prince. The Akkadians this time went straight for the cities, and armies were less caught out by attritional warfare. He rolled through the Elamite territory all the way to the land of Marhashi, knocking on the eastern king's door, and politely informed him through violence not to disrupt Akkadian affairs ever again. The Elamites were returned to vassal status and punished, though not as harshly as the Sumerians had been, it seems, while the Marhashi themselves were plundered hard, but in return to the old ways, they don't seem to have been bound into the empire, just plundered. Having spent his entire reign regaining control of his father's territories, Ramush knew well what places were simply beyond his reach. The whole adventure may have taken about a year, give or take, and at the end of it, Ramush returned with cart after cart of plunder. In just the city of Nippur, Ramush dedicated 30 pounds of gold, 3,600 pounds of copper, and 300 slaves to the Temple of Enlo. And from the exotic stone objects, bowls, vases, maces, and such that are scattered around the empire, we know this was not the only such donation to follow the campaign. But the most impressive single piece of plunder was enough tin for Ramush to have a statue made of it of himself. Tin doesn't impress the modern ear very much, but it was a crucial and rare resource during the Bronze Age. Bronze itself is a mixture of copper and tin, and the scarcity of tin in the region was the main limiting industrial factor. To have brought home enough of the precious metal to cast a life-size monument in his own glory would have likely have been more impressive than a similarly sized gold sculpture. So proud of it was he that the statue was placed opposite Enlil, king of gods, in his main temple. But what was his brother doing during all this time? Well, Manishtishu certainly had some sort of position within the court, one which gave him access to the scribes and priests and courtiers and nobles. And he seems to have spent his time trash-talking his brother. Look at all these rebellions, Manishtishu would say to whichever insider he was courting that day. Surely this is proof that my brother has failed to please the gods. Sargon never had these problems. Clearly Ramush is unfit to be king. After all, he may have been conceived first, but I'm the elder by birth. The throne should be mine. Ramush was a man used to command. He'd spent his life learning kingship from the best king ever, 
He knew how to maneuver and supply an army, and how to manage trade and labor levies. He was deeply pious and fairly straightforward. When he deified his father, it's likely that he genuinely worshipped his father, even as he understood the power dynamics of such a move. He was a man of action, who believed strongly in the proper order of things, and when men rose up in rebellion, he felt no moral outrage against restoring the balance of the universe. His brother, on the other hand, had been raised among the palace courtiers, and considered them his people. He was far more astute as a politician, and more inclined to get his way through dealing and scheming than through the more direct means his brother favored. And so the tail end of Ramush's reign seems to have witnessed a slow leeching of court support by his brother, including major officials of many major cities, seeing many records simply go silent for these final few years. Some speculate that there was a civil war in this silent moment of history, but if there really were concerns that Ramush was going to move from deifying his father to proclaiming himself a living god, a thing hinted at in some of his actions, then it would make sense that the temples could fall silent in the face of this heresy, especially if they joined Manishtusu's faction on the down low. No. There was no overt civil war. The record is, in fact, far too silent for that. Rather, there was a quiet power shift that Ramush may not have even noticed at all until it was too late. It became generally accepted among the ruling classes that, despite his plunder and battlefield successes, Ramush had lost the favor of the gods. And so one day, without warning, Ramush was surrounded by courtiers, who beat him to death with their clay cylinder seals of office and strangled him with his own necklace. His brother then assumed the throne with little fuss. And so, having spent nine years re-establishing control of the empire and doing the hard work of demonstrating to the vassals that the Akkadian dynasty was here to stay, Ramush was killed and managed to shoo was able to take over the now stable empire for himself, freed of all the tedious rebellion smashing that had so occupied his brother. A great cosmic injustice for sure, but one which actually seems to have worked out for the better. Ramush was a military man, while Manish Tashu was a politician. Neither likely would have been able to fill the other's shoes had the birth order been reversed. Each man was half the man his father was. Together, they could have been more impressive than the footnote that they ended up being, but there aren't a whole lot of stories about friendly, peaceful cooperation in Sumerian or Akkadian literature, mostly tales of domination and conquest. Gilgamesh and Enkidu is perhaps the only exception, but even there, many manuscripts emphasize the lesser place of Enkidu in that relationship, so even their hierarchy and dominance is a core concern. Anyway, Manishtashu took his new kingship slowly. He builds and consolidates power through mechanisms that are mostly invisible to us. Things like conquests and constructions leave marks that survive the ages, but greasing palms and coddling governors are the invisible tasks that create the stable foundation for an empire to manage those bigger works. Notably, he seems to have been more focused on the traditional Semitic heartlands to the north in Assyria and the Akkadian region, and relatively more neglectful of Sumer, which would contribute to the relative scarcity of Sumerian records about his reign. Since his yearly labor levies weren't going as often towards bolstering the military, he would have set them to construction projects, and most of these appear to have taken place in the north of the empire and in the Akkadian heartland and would mostly have been temples, palaces, forts, and administrative centers, since canal building was almost unknown outside Sumer, likely due to the rockier terrain and slightly more regular rainfall rendering it both more expensive and less crucial. He also went on a tour of at least his northern provinces, with circumstantial evidence that he made it as far north as Assur and even distant Nineveh, where his personal charm and political skills would have helped the governors and local nobles feel like it wasn't just military force keeping them in the empire. 
Additionally, he broke ground on or inspected a number of building projects. Still, Manishtashu was no pacifist and could not afford to be seen as incapable of exercising his military might. But on the other hand, when he looked to the map of his realm, the problem arose that there were very few places left to conquer. The empire stretched incredibly far to the northwest, where the borders were who knows what past the rugged Anatolian mountains, or Egypt to the southwest. And with regards to Egypt, the two ancient civilizations certainly knew about each other and had trade routes to a greater or lesser extent over the years, but I can find no official documentation that they ever interacted in any official way. This would have been smack in the middle of the Old Kingdom's sixth and final dynasty, but it seems likely at this point Egypt was simply seen as too far away to get troops there. If he were to look southwest of the Euphrates River, well, there's nothing there but the deserts of modern Saudi, no point going there, and similarly when he looked northeast, he could see nothing but the Iranian and Armenian mountains, filled with barbarians, poverty, and rough terrain. That's hardly better than the trackless desert. The Elamites had already been cowed, and behind them was just endless mountains as far as anyone knew. And so, where could the Akkadian Empire march for Manish to Shu's glory? The answer was that they wouldn't march anywhere. They would sail. Now, it was unclear to the extent which boats had previously been used to transport soldiers to war. The Sumerians and Akkadians had never had substantial battle navies, trade and supply ships for sure, but war on the water appears to have been out of their comfort zone. And so it was new and attention-grabbing, and given the amount of wood required, a tremendously expensive act when Manishtashu ordered the construction of a navy capable of sailing them down the Persian Gulf, or the Lower Sea as they called it in the days before Persia existed. He set off with a fair bit of pomp and circumstance, with a considerable army and presumably the most experienced sailors Mesopotamia could gather. The fleet sailed south along the coast until reaching distant Magan, most likely the modern-day Emirates or Oman. There is a bit of confusion with the terms Magan, Meluha, and Dilmun, though. Traders from all three places arrived in Mesopotamian ports with some regularity, so all three places were known, though distant enough to be semi-mythic to the common man. Each is identified with one of three ancient civilizations. The Indus Valley Civilization, the Umm al nar culture in modern emirates, the prehistoric people of Bahrain, or possibly even Egypt and Sudan. But which goes with which is sometimes a bit confused, and possibly even the Sumerians would get them confused at times. Still, in this case, it seems most likely that Manishtashu sailed to a settlement not too far from modern Abu Dhabi, which would have been more hospitable for farming in those days than it is now, but more importantly, was a major trading hub. The Akkadians reached Magan without problems and began to raid coastal towns. At some point, he engaged in a sea battle, or perhaps a running series of sea battles, which is the first naval engagement in the record. No details survive as to how the battle was fought, or if it was a contest of seamanship, or if the ships simply bored at each other and fought with land tactics on their floating platforms, but however it happened, the Akkadians proved victorious. For Manishtashu, distant Magan was not a place that could reasonably be held, so he contented himself with the older style of victory, returning home with boats weighed down with riches. But oh, what riches he brought back. Most importantly from this great boatload of plunder was a huge amount of diorite, an ornamental stone completely foreign to Mesopotamia. Now, by itself, this is rather unexceptional. He is, at this point, the third king to bring all sorts of exotic plunder into Akkad. But what sets Manishtashu apart, what proves that he is uniquely clever, even among his own dynasty, is what he does with this diorite. <laughs> 
Manish Deshu takes the industrial forms pioneered by his father and creates a factory with dozens of sculptors, all of whom mass produce a single sculpture of the king, nearly a meter tall, with a single standard inscription at its base. This standard inscription came in three parts. First, introducing and exalting King Manish to show. Next, recounting his impressive deeds, sailing to distant Magan, and bringing the very stone of the statue all the way back. And finally, laying a curse on any who would damage or disrespect the statue. Hundreds of these were produced, and each was sent to a city where it would sit in some central public space. And I did just say they were standardized, but interestingly, each inscription was slightly modified for each recipient city, with the patron god of the city that would be receiving the statue being used as a dedication and invoked to protect the statue and, by extension, the king from external harm. So, for the statue in Nippur, the inscription is dedicated to Enlil on Menish Deshu's behalf, while the Uruk statue is dedicated to Ishtar, and so on. In this manner, the king is doing two things at once. He's centralizing and unifying his empire by making his face and accomplishments known throughout the empire. For a merchant or other traveler, the ability to see the exact same statue made out of this striking alien stone would have created a common point of reference within each city. We don't think much of it today in the age where every city has an identical everything, but in those days it was all handmade, and for something so striking to be mass-produced on an empire-wide scale was a serious display of wealth, power, and vision. At the same time, it was showing respect for a crucial local symbol, respecting the traditions of the particular cities and showing that Manishashu cared about more than just his personal god and the gods of Akkad, but also that the city's local god was being personally respected by the king himself. And he was not simply sending out these statues, he was also patronizing temples across the realm, further cementing his piety one city at a time. But in these temple renovations, he insisted on a certain degree, again, of standardization. We see his image being copied out more regularly than previous kingly icons were, probably because local sculptors now had the Manish Deshu statues in every city to work off of. And the inscriptions are also increasingly use standardized language and increased use of Akkadian words and grammar in temple and governmental texts. As for diorite in general, it appears to become something of a royal stone, either because no one else could get their hands on it, or because that status was enshrined in law. And so we have many other monuments, less standardized and more in keeping with the older standard. And so we have many other monuments, less standardized and more in keeping with the older style of monument, that preserve his standard praises, as well as more specific deeds, such as the largest single purchase of land on record for the age, some 3,500 hectares purchased for an unknown but doubtlessly large sum, and followed by a great feast. And in this way, Manish Deshu's reign passed quietly. He had one more great land expedition into the distant Elamite city of Anshan, who likely thought that distance would prevent a king fond of luxury from rebuking them. They were wrong on that count, though we have no details on the campaign except that he probably brought more loot home. Fifteen years passed years of prosperity and consolidation, when finally the king who had murdered his brother to come into power was in turn assassinated by his own son, tired of waiting for his turn to assume his great ambitions. But before we get into the patricidal son, a word on omens and astronomy in Mesopotamian culture. Omens were everywhere in Mesopotamian society, chiefly a magical discipline called haruspicy, involving reading the entrails of slaughtered animals to determine the future. They used many other methods, however, and were tremendously superstitious, my favorite being a listing of every sort of mixed mating that can be observed in the world, and what the meaning of each is.
So it says, if a sheep has intercourse with a dog, then the man who witnesses it will receive a treasure. While if a white sheep mounts a she-goat, there will be disagreement in the land. Nearly every conceivable combination of mixed animal mating is listed, including humans, and most of them, as you might expect, are bad news. But that's just an amusing footnote. The point is that we usually think of ancient Mesopotamians as the inventors of astronomy. They are, after all, the reason that we divide time and circles into base 60, their preferred base for complicated mathematics. But until this point in the story, we've hardly heard anything at all about the stars or advanced mathematics. For sure, they had the sort of general math that most ancient cultures managed to develop, enough geometry to describe and demarcate a field or build a large building, enough addition and multiplication to keep track of inventories and production, and a few more advanced concepts like averages and the rates of things. But they're not yet the mathematical powerhouse that they will become. Manishtishu's death changes all that. You see, by sheer coincidence, his death happened to coincide with an eclipse, a fact useful to later historians attempting to date these events, though not one that's universally accepted, since there are still three major sets of dates usually proposed for the entire Akkadian Empire. This turned a few heads in the superstitious Akkadian Empire, but when his successor managed to also die in close proximity to an eclipse 37 years later, well, people really started to take notice then. It can't be proven, and this could well be a detail invented much later, but it appears to be the seed that would get people interested in astronomy, or at least astrology, and begin developing the observational and mathematical tools that would eventually become the sophisticated systems of the Babylonians in a few hundred years. A fun little legend, though one with a good bit of uncertainty around it. In any case, Manishtishu's murder was likely not his son directly, though he is generally cited as the one pulling the strings. And so next week we will meet this new king, a man who would outdo even his legendary grandfather's achievements and through vision, ambition, and competence bring the Akkadian Empire to its high watermark. So join me next time as we begin the legends and history of King Naram Sin. Thank you for listening.